I don't see anything, man. Folks, welcome to the Jake Feinberg <laughs> Show here at the Topa Mountain Winery. It is an absolutely scorching day. I left Tucson. It was about 110 degrees, and it's even hotter here. I get an opportunity to talk to uh, an incredible musician, a guy who's uh, been expanding music vocabulary. Yeah, look around. Who's here? He's been expanding music voc vocabulary on the bandstand for the last half century. Paul Barrer, an honor to welcome you to the Jake Feinberg Show, brother. What's up, man? You know, I wanted to ask you, um, this is just, just leading off, can you talk about... Uh, what your major intentions are when you play music? Is it to touch people's hearts? What is, what's the major objective at this point in your career? Um, to have fun. I mean, music's something that you're supposed to do to have a good time, express yourself, you know? Uh, we're fortunate in Little Feet that we have a, a bazillion songs that have uh, a lot of room for stretching out. And that's pretty much what we do. And it's great that we got cats like Joe and Daryl and Tony to join us because that's pretty much the school they come from too. And it's, uh, you know. Let me ask you, how does the how does the horn section allow you guys to stretch even more? Oh, it just adds a, you know an element of the funk that's uh, that's kind of missing when we don't have keys or you know it's just Fred and I and Kenny and Tony, which is that's a cool thing too. But you know when you got horns, you know it gets a little bit more musical. I mean, I guess for me, I just would like to know when Little Feet actually started to incorporate horns in a live setting. I mean, there's that classic double album with horns, but on a lot of the studio stuff that you did, there wasn't always horns on it. No. When did you start bringing that into the live context? Uh, I think Tom was a hero. I think that's uh, pretty much when we got Tower Power coming in to play on stuff. Emilio? Oh, uh, yeah. Doc Kupka? Doc. Um, Greg Adams, Mick Gillette, and Lenny Pickett. You know, it was like the cats back then. And uh, so when we did Waiting for Columbus, we took them with us. And it was. Uh, people want you to. People want to hear you. They want you to, to speak a little bit louder. Oh, they do. They want you to speak Jeez. louder. But going back, I, 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 this hey, I'm is, trying to be funky in there. <laughs> <laughs> the the uh, a lot of things people don't realize that. Uh, that you grew up with Leroy Vinegar's son, and I've, I've dedicated my show to the unsung heroes of music, mainly the jazzers. And I just want you to talk a little bit about what Leroy, and you know, I mean, maybe not so much his, his son, but what Leroy meant early on to you as an inspiration, as a musical inspiration to you. Well, you know, I picture I'm 13 years old, and uh, I'm just starting to play the guitar. His son was playing drums, and we had this other friend who played bass. And Leroy said, well, I want to know where you guys are on the weekend, so here's a bass amp, here's a guitar amp, here's a nice Stratocaster, here's a set of drums. Be in the garage, you know, stretch out. And so he pretty much got us, or got me started, really playing electrically. And uh, then he would, you know, he was in education. He took, he took us to Shelley's Manhole to see people like Dexter Gordon, uh, Miles Davis, Tony Williams, uh, God, just a ton of people. You know, that when you're 13, 14 years old, you're thinking, that's the stuff. That's what I want to do. Because it was still considered popular music at that time, and it was also, I mean, would you say that your biggest influences were, I found this revelatory talking to cats like Trope, John Trope, his his biggest influences were not guitar players. They were horn players, the lines that they used. I mean, who who did you get off on that was not a guitar player in the jazz scene? <laughs> well, the guys that I mentioned, obviously, but I liked a lot of the guitar players. Gabor Zabo was a favorite of mine. Um, my early influences, though, were Muddy Waters and Robert Johnson. So it was, you know, I came, I came through the, the whole kind of folk blues situation. I remember seeing Taj Mahal at the Ashgrove when he was a kid. I saw him in Was he in a jug band, maybe? Huh? Was he in a jug band? Uh, no, he was just playing solo. Just solo. And then uh, I saw him with this band that he and Rye had. I think it was the Rising Suns. And, uh, oh, man, that was a trip and a half. It was great. There's, uh, you know, 
influences come from all different kind of places. Yeah. And one of those is, uh, I'm just curious how hip you were to the, to the Southern California funk scene, uh, Roland Batiste. Uh, did, I mean, when did you cr first cross paths with Kenny Gradney? Like the mm. first time you actually got hip to him, did you see him, you know, because he, he, he never considered himself a jazz player. He was R&B and funk, but I mean, he was also crossing over uh, with all those cats. Uh, McKee was down there too. Earth, Wind, and Fire. When did you first? Oh, McKay. I mean, people. Yeah. Were, when did when did you first see Kenny Gradney? Uh, at uh, Warner Brothers Studios on the set of the uh, Crest Toothpaste. Bill Cosby <laughs> sliding down the sliding we were, down the. Uh, and we were all newbies to the Little Feet scene, and uh, we rehearsed there what a couple of weeks, Kenny. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> and then the next thing I know, we're standing in the crater in Diamond Head playing a show, and it was like it was surreal. <laughs> Um, what are you still learning about uh, musically in, in your career at this point? I mean, you talk to anybody, whether it's Ahmad Jamal or Tony Brown Nagel, I mean, everybody's still learning. And what are you still learning? Um, well, I'm using a lot more of the, uh, the things I learned when I was younger. Like what? Uh, Van Dyke Parks gave me a very, very good inspiration. He said, it's the space between the notes that are really important. So, I'm into the space these days. <laughs> well, you've always been there. <laughs> well, some days more than others. <laughs> Do you believe that uh, musical vocabulary can grow in academia? I mean, I can't imagine Paul Brer going to Berklee School of Music or USC. No. I mean, when Dugu Chancellor told me, rest in peace, he said, you know, the biggest problem going on now is that the cats in academia are the best, you know, they're the best of the best from the w in the world. But they don't go out and play with the guys with rubber bands around their horns on the street. So you're missing the blues, all right? You're, you're missing that co coalescing between the street scholar and academia. I want you to talk, I want you to talk about, because you guys, Little Feet truly expanded music vocabulary in several different genres of music, and I hate using genres. But what, do you believe that musical vocabulary can increase in academia, or is it only on the bandstand? I think it, it, you know, I think it happens more when you're woodshed, you know, because you're, you're working things out, you know, that you can bring to the band. Yes, but the, uh, the, uh, there's, I know a lot of cats who, who've gone to GIT, who are just amazing players, you know. Uh, some can, you know, get down with it, and others are just basically cats who, you know, can play the written note. My grandfather was a classical flute player. He was a Dixieland, or was your dad a Dixielander? My dad was a Dixieland fan. He was an actor, but my grandfather was a, a classical musician. He taught at Juilliard. He played with the New York Philharmonic. He came over from France in 1903, but he would rehearse eight hours a day, and he couldn't he couldn't jam to save his ass. <laughs> <laughs> He could play, you know, he wrote books on variations of Bach and so forth, but, you know. Just for a lot of younger peeps out there that uh, are a little more insecure, they have less opportunities to play live and actually get in the studio and cut record deals because there's not much of a record industry. Can you talk about Lowell George's philosophy as it related to everybody getting a cut in terms of uh, publishing credits and how, how, how much that helped the band just stay tight? He, he was the fairest cat I think I've ever met. Can you give an example of that? Because I mean, people are like, no, it's it's all mine now. They're, they're just such little. There's not enough of the pie to go around anymore, and some or people are so frenetic about it. Can you give an example of when that the first time he he was fair? Um, when we did Dixie Chicken, he, you know, his his philosophy was if you played on the song, you were part of the publishing. You might not be part of the writers, but you are part of the publishing company. And it kept a lot of us going because, you know, we didn't all write as much as uh, Lowell did. So, you know, you get a little, little something, something, it, you know, keeps you coming back. <laughs> have you tried to, have you done that in your career as a leader? I mean, I see you on these. I try my best. I really do. You can ask him. <laughs> Kenny Grant. All right, one final question for you, Paul, before I let you go. Yes. Don't let us keep you up, Kenny. 
Yeah, no, they can't grab me up, snoring away. Uh, um, can you talk about Safety Harbor Kids? I mean, I, I've been blessed to come here and, and chronicle this event. Um, what do you know about these kids that are coming tonight, and why do you do this? I do it, um, well, first and foremost, because Petri came to us years ago, Fred and I said. Oh, Petri. <laughs> Hi, Petri. Hey, hey. Bless you, Petri. Thank you. Bless you for being Bless here. Bless you, Petri. And she said. So Petri came you know, to you years ago and said what? She says, I'm doing this thing for, for the kids, for inner city kids and so forth. And, that, you know, it really helps them out. It, it you know, puts them on a, a good path. And I thought, well, that's swinging, cool. And uh, I think the first one we did was at the Malibu Inn, and then we did one out on the Malibu baseball field. That was insane. She had, she had uh, <laughs> chicks on ropes. Oh man, where are all the chicks on ropes anymore? Fancy <laughs> girls, love fancy girls tonight. Chicks yeah. on ropes. Chicks on ropes. Um, so this is this is love, is what yeah. you're saying. It's love. Yeah. We're doing this, you know, we're doing it for the kids. Now when I'm playing for money, I like to tell people we're doing it for the kids. Mine. <laughs> also, what do you, what do you, does Tony Brown Nagel uh, leave enough space in the music? I mean, I'm really looking for you guys to break up time and form relentlessly tonight. Like, you know, take as many bars as you want. Just go. Tony, go. Tony is a beast, man. He's, you know, there's not a space that he doesn't fill. <laughs> he crowds the shit out of everybody. <laughs> no, Tony's great. <laughs> We've done quite a few gigs together with Tony and. Uh, I mean, Gradney. Yeah. Gradney calls him and Johnny Lee Shaw, but his Texas contingent. Yeah. Right. But Absolutely. when was the first time you crossed paths with Brown Nagel? I mean, was it in? Because I mean, he went to. He was in England at Island Studios. He was all over the place. I think it was in England Still. with Little Feet. Really? Yeah. Tony, is that true? Yeah, I believe so. Uh, well, right around the same time uh, in, in the mid 70s, 475, yeah. right around there. And then I came back and ran into you guys again uh, at a couple of concerts in the United States. One in Houston, Texas. Yeah. Backstage. And then, um, God, was it then that you got the gig with Bonnie? No, that was 84. Oh. But I, you, I auditioned for your band before that. Remember when I first moved to Los Angeles in 79? Oh, and. Uh, when well, Richie was kicked out or something. Well, you were doing like a solo thing, just you oh. and Neil Larson. Oh, right, right. Larson's and tuning Buzzy. in right now. Huh? And Buzzy Feetin. And Buzzy Feetin, and, and yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, we wanted to call ourselves the Junkies. <laughs> 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 I'm sure Buzz is going to love love that. Yeah. yeah. Um, final uh, final <laughs> thing. Is this actually being aired? No. People are having a ball. <laughs> You uh, talk about the, in you, putting yourself aside. What is the health of the live touring circuit in this country? Why music to me is consumed in Europe and Japan now, but what about this country? There's a lot of bands touring. I mean, Jesus, look at Dead Incorporated. Or Dead, Incorporated. Dead no, it's Dead Incorporated. It's a money grab. It's not. There's no. <laughs> But what about the idea of region, like Phil Lesh has Terrapin Crossroads, that's a regional hub for all the younger cats east and west coast to come. How do you continue to, to keep the brother, you're talking about Buzzy, you're talking about, no. how, do you keep the, how do you keep the lineage of music together? You know, you just do the best that you can. Um, you know, um, it's nice to have a good book page, and I'll tell you that. And, uh, you know, for the younger bands, you know, I, when I first heard that they had to go out and sell their own tickets, I said, well, everything's gone ass backwards. You know, this is just, this is not the way it's supposed to be. Yeah, you can play my club if you can sell 250 tickets. It's like, what? You know, no, it, they've gotten lazy, shall we say. So the, the band's got to do all the work. you got to do social media. Even though I'm an anti-social mother. Well, you're ta <laughs> people are having a ball. I mean, no, but I mean... Uh... When did, when did it happen that, uh, that music that no no that music became a musician's gift to the world and not a profession? I mean, Dizzy and Miles were never millionaires, but they were treated with huge amounts of respect for their ability to play, and they got paid. Yeah. But the pay-to-play mentality 
What's your message to people? I mean, is it is it a patronage issue? Is it a supply and demand issue? Um, I'm not really sure, but you know, if you think about it, um, you know, I don't think Bach and Beethoven and Mozart and all those cats <laughs> got a dime. <laughs> you know, they would have you know uh, angels, as we say, who took care of them. You know, unless you were Wagner and you were playing for the Third Reich, but <laughs> it's like, you know, it's the music industry has has changed so much. I really don't recognize it a whole lot, to tell you the truth. You feel like you're still in it, or are you just? Oh yeah. You don't recognize it though. No, it's it's a different scene from, you know, when we were selling vinyls back when. And there was radio stations that would actually. Be radio stations, you know. Well, I mean, people were getting their records played in San Francisco, and they were in, Muscle White was in Chicago. His records were getting played in Oakland. He moved out there, you know. Yeah. Almost seems like a different country. Anyway, uh, Paul, you're, you might be anti-social media, but people really <laughs> loved seeing you, man. And uh, I'm just calling out for maybe one or two Alan Two Saint tunes tonight, if you know if Grad and you can pull it together. Oh yeah, he's yeah, he's good. Paul Barrera, thank you for being part of the program. Take it easy, man. That's cool. We'll be back later.